Good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to this um, webinar. We have well over a thousand people from all over Australia and all parts of Australia as well, rural and metropolitan, so it's wonderful to see you there. Um, Mental Health Professionals Network wishes to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay respect to the elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia. I'll start off just by introducing myself, then I'll introduce our presenters. I'm the facilitator for this evening. Um, I'm a social worker and psychologist in private practice in mental health with children and young people. And I've done a number of the webinars which are always extremely interesting. Um, you saw the biogs of the panellists, so just to introduce them face to face. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Conrad Kangaroo, a Queensland-based general practitioner. Um, Conrad, you've worked in a rural area, and what services do you find exist in rural areas for people who are experiencing loss and grief? We, uh, we certainly do struggle up here with access to, to psychiatry. Yeah. We have a lot of dependence on our, our visiting psychologists. We're also fortunate enough to, uh, to have access to, to more and more online support programs as well these days. So there's a, a lot there which uh, hopefully is giving us better hope for the future. But no doubt at the end of the day, the, the general practitioner in rural areas still is Okay. Thank you. Um, the next person I'd like to introduce is Professor Kay Wilhelm. We don't have Kay on camera, there's a technical hitch there. Um, I'll introduce you Kay. Um, is a, Kay is a psychiatrist in New South Wales. She's the Clinical Director of Consultation and Liaison Psychiatry and Research Director of Faces in the Street, St Vincent's Urban Mental Health and Wellbeing Research Institute at St Vincent's in Sydney. She is a conjoint professor in psychiatry at the University of New South Wales and a professor fellow at the Black Dog Institute. It's good to have you with us, Kay, although we can't see you at the moment anyway. <laughs> Thank you, and I'm um, really sorry to hold you up with trying to get online with this program. No, no, no worries at all. We're, we're rocking along now. Uh, I just had something I thought of asking you about, actually, given your experience in this area. Um, any comment you might have briefly on the association between complicated grief and physical ill health? Oh, that's not a brief one, but it will come up in my talk. <laughs> All right, we'll leave it till then. We'll leave it till then. Um, next, thanks, Kay. I'd now like to introduce Greg Roberts, who's a practicing social worker with 19 years' experience in work in the health and community services sector. And in 2001, he began to specialise in the field of grief, loss, and trauma. And Greg, I understand that you have just completed your PhD. Um, what was your research topic about? Uh, thanks, Vicky. Um, my research topic was on the um, spontaneous creative activities that bereaved parents engaged with. So I was particularly interested in the things that people did in response to their grief and loss. Um, and Very interesting. In which that was useful to them. Very interesting and unusual topic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, it was interesting research to engage with, with the participants. Definitely, I imagine. Yeah. Ooh, thank you very much. Thanks. And last, um, and not least, I'd like to welcome Associate Professor Moira O'Connor. Moira is a Senior Research Fellow in the School of Psychology and Speech Pathology at Curtin in Perth, and Moira's program of research is applied and community-based with a focus on health and wellbeing, and addresses psychological aspects of cancer and palliative care. And well, I just wondered if you had any comment about, I mean, I, I, from reading certain of the resource material, um, I understand our thinking has changed about um, responding to grief reactions or how, how they impact on people. What would be a noticeable change that you've observed in your research experience about grief reactions and how they're perceived now? You mean in terms of the theoretical or in terms of how people react in, in terms of their grief? Which which side well, are you asking, sorry? Well, yeah, how, how people respond, yes. Well, people respond in unique ways. I mean, um, mm. that's 
is one of the things about brief that they are, you know, the multivariate responses and, and people tend to move forward, so restoration, um, but they also look backwards and, and oscillate between the two. Um, most people navigate the middle path, but we're going to be talking tonight about people who perhaps uh, um, concentrate on, on either end of, of that oscillation. Yes. Thank you very much, Moira. Well, thank you to our presenters for introducing themselves. Um, there we are. So just some brief ground rules for this evening. Um, so everybody can see what you're saying on the chat room. Um, and yes, wait to the end to complete the exit survey, which will appear. Uh, and uh, if you don't like um, the chat box, you can minimise it by clicking the down arrow. So um, just take note of that if you don't want to look at the chat. It's a bit distracting. There are our learning outcomes describing the difference between complicated grief and depression, implementing key principles of providing an integrated graded approach in the early identification, and what are challenges, tips and strategies to provide a collaborative response to assist people who are experiencing complicated grief. Now before we move on to Conrad's um, PowerPoint presentation about his response, just a few words to remind us about the case. Dorothy is a 55-year-old woman, her husband of 30 years died seven years ago. She has no history of depression, but she's having difficulty coping after her father's death. She hasn't wanted to participate in activities that she used to do with Arthur, such as fishing and camping. She goes over that day that Arthur died and feels responsible for not calling an ambulance. She's sometimes inconsolable, especially around anniversaries such as birthdays and Christmas, and life isn't enjoyable. And often calls her daughter, crying and saying she doesn't want to be here anymore because it's just not the same without Arthur. So Conrad, um, thank you. Would you like to do your presentation? Indeed, Vicky. So as, as a general practitioner, and, and uh, I know that these are sentiments that, that all of my colleagues online who are general practitioners are going to share as well, but this certainly hits us pretty hard. Uh, we, would, we would assume that Dorothy is, is one of our regular patients. We've uh, probably been seeing her you know, a couple of times a year at least, statistics would suggest that, it, that it's at least 1.5 times per year over several years. And so there's every likelihood that we've actually watched her through the progression of this. In fact, there's a very high chance that we were Arthur's general practitioner as well uh, before he uh, sadly passed away. So just to, to recap on the, the events that happened with Arthur, if anybody's not familiar with the, the case study, was that uh, they had been together, happily married, they'd, they'd raised their, their children. But when Arthur was very young, he was uh, diagnosed with a, a, a valve disorder which, uh, which requires surgery. And, uh, and now subsequently, seven years ago, the, uh, he had a, a sudden uh, cardiac event and, uh, and passed away. And so my immediate concern there as, as a general practitioner dealing with Dorothy's scenario now is that this really isn't a normal progression for her to, to go through. You know, we, we, we are certainly familiar with what, uh, with what, what guilt, with what grief is, and we'd all acknowledge that this isn't really what we think, you know, grief would be uh, after seven years. So you, you do start putting up a little bit of a, a, a retrospective uh, analysis on, on, look, what actually has been gone, going on over, over all of this time. And so when we're actually talking to Dorothy, or in fact even talking to her daughter, who is obviously very concerned about mum, we start being a little bit mindful about, okay, so is there some issues about guilt that's going on here as well? We've already seen in the case study that Dorothy is very concerned about why didn't she ring the ambulance? She's already, we already know that you know, she wasn't going to drive fast to the hospital because she was worried about, about speed. And so you're worrying that there's already going to be some degree of guilt which is happening there and, and is becoming quite pathological for, for Dorothy. My concern then also is that we've been watching her for, for seven years. Do we then feel that we share some of that guilt? Do we then take some of that on, on board? And we have to be very careful to not lay any guilt or, or any blame for this uh, as well. 
poor Dorothy is already kicking herself that she didn't ring the ambulance at the time. And certainly we might have that, that response of, oh, well, maybe you should have rung the ambulance at the time. And that's when you start coming into these really dangerous areas of the therapeutic relationship. And I hope that many of my colleagues are, are familiar with concepts like transference and, and counter-transference. In that if we are actually imposing on Dorothy, well, yeah, actually that's what you should have done. You know, this never would have been, wouldn't have been the case then we might start seeing that actually that's a transference and that's really not helpful to it at all. And by the same token, is, is Dorothy actually now starting to see in us that we should have picked something up as, as the general practitioner, that maybe we should have picked something up earlier and that, uh, that, that we need to, to take on some of that, that, that blame as well. So whilst we're trying to make sure that we're there and we're providing help for, for Dorothy and that we're giving her a great supporting uh, therapeutic relationship which we all wish that we can nurture for our patients, we always just watch out for those boundary issues that might be creeping in there as well. Now, of course, another part of the issue that happens with Dorothy is that we've been watching her evolve through another chronic disease over this period of, of time. And so we know that something like rheumatoid arthritis, that on its own is, is associated with, with disability, with chronic pain, with reduction in, in independence. And we might actually have been quite tempted to ascribe some of those symptoms that we now look back at as and say, well, actually, maybe that's more significant of, of depression but we were actually thinking maybe that had more to do with the rheumatoid arthritis. So there's some concerns there as well which we're going to need to, to, to build on with, with time. But we have that wonderful, unique situation that the general practitioner has is that we know Dorothy. We know what her usual functioning level is like. She knows us. She trusts us. And we hope that her daughter also has that trust and faith in her as well. And that's, that's an absolute sacred uh, privilege which we as general practitioners hold, hold dear. But what is also is that that concept that you can't see the woods for the trees, that sometimes it can be very difficult to see that actually there have been an accumulation of subtle changes which may have been happening in Dorothy's mood over a long period of time that we were alert to. So it's entirely possible that we just weren't really suspecting a major depressive disorder or adjustment disorder at the, at the time. And it's not really until, until now that we hear from Dorothy's daughter that she just doesn't want to be here anymore that we actually really have to sit up and, and, and pay attention and, uh, and, and look at what, what's actually going on. So although there might be a of Dorothy at this point in time, we definitely preserve that sacred role of the general practitioner in remaining central to the ongoing care and coordination which Dorothy's going to need over a long period of time. So we're just going to move on a little bit to what are some of those practicalities of, of care that we, that we look for with her. And one of them is that a very important tool which is available to us as general practitioners now is the general practice mental health care plan. Now it certainly has gone through some changes o over the years and the access issues have gone up and down but there is no doubt that under the current item descriptors Dorothy would be eligible for one of these items. So if you do have vocational registration, oh sorry, if you do have your mental health skills training level one, you would be eligible to bill those as a 2715 or a 2717. And if you don't have your mental health skills training, which I'm sure there's not many of our participants who don't, then that's the MBI items 2700 and 2701. <coughs> Now, as we mentioned earlier, grief on its own is actually a natural part of life and we shouldn't really be pathologizing that and saying that that's a disorder. But this is now moving on to a lot more than just a simple grief reaction. So whether it gets called an adjustment disorder or a recurrent depressive disorder, both of those are significant mental illness diagnoses. And although we might not as general practitioners be familiar with all of the barrage of assessment tools that are at the hands of the psychologist, those that we really are very familiar with, the, the Kessler 10 uh, distress scale or the, or the DAS score would both be completely appropriate for us to use in our initial outcome assessment for her. But if there are other tools which you're comfortable with and proficient with in your daily practice, by all means go for it and use them. 
but whatever we do in our assessment of, of Dorothy, this flag that she just doesn't want to be here anymore, we can't brush that off. You can't unhear something like that. So we do have to formally assess what actually is the suicidality risk which we're, which we're facing. We have to ask about intent. Are there access to means? And so that might be as simple as the prescription medications. Have there actually been prior attempts for all patients that have been there? And what sort of supports does Dorothy have in place since this actually coming to a point of reality? And it might be that if you're actually seriously concerned that, that uh, the Dorothy presents a serious suicide risk or harm to herself or others, you really do need to be familiar with the legislation in your own state because I know that here in Queensland, she certainly might be eligible or might be, uh, might be required to be uh, put under an involuntary mental health assessment and transferred for, for psychiatric care at that, at that, that stage. So, as the GP, what do we do now? We, uh, we, we deal with, with, with her in front of us at this point in time, obviously at a crisis moment. So we have to think about pharmacotherapy going to be appropriate for her. And I would have to say that I'm very cautious about, the, about get sending her off with sleeping tablets or anxiolytics which is in, in such a state. And whilst it might be appropriate that, that, uh, that antidepressant medications such as our selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors might be appropriate for her, we acknowledge that they take time to, uh, to, to have a, a therapeutic effect and we really would be reluctant to depend on that as our sole intervention at this stage in time. I would definitely be looking at psycholo psychologist referral for, for Dorothy. I think there's a lot there which she's going to benefit from. But it might actually be that at this point in time, while she's acutely distressed, that might not be the best way to go, particularly if we are looking at a bit of a waiting time to get in to see somebody up here. Of course, we also have some wonderful online resources which might be great for her to use and, uh, and Black Dog Institute, uh, 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 Beyond Blue, Lifeline, uh, eHealth, e e a whole lot of barrage of those are great to use. But I think, Vicky, at this point in time, I'm going to have to acknowledge that uh, psychiatrist input might be completely appropriate for Dorothy, and I'd be looking to involve one of my, uh, one of my specialist colleagues for her at this, at this point in time. The decision that I would need to make in conjunction with Dorothy and her daughter is, is that that's something which we need to look at as an inpatient admission, or could she actually go for an outpatient uh, appointment? And whilst I'm hopeful that she's going to uh, comply with my request for a voluntary, uh, voluntary assessment, that, that means therefore it is available if she needs to go as, a, as an involuntary patient. So I'm happy to hand it back to you on that one, Vicky. Thanks. Thank you very much, Conrad. Um, now I'd like to introduce um, Kay, Dr. Kay, Professor Kay Wilhelm for her presentation and I will be clicking the slides for Kay on your instruction, Kay, when you want to go to the next one. Okay, thank you. Well, I do think a psychiatrist has something to add at this point, I have to say. And just looking at Dorothy's histories, there are some gaps that I'd like to fill in. And I'm assuming that I know the GP reasonably well, but I haven't met Dorothy before because she's got no past mental health history. So I'd want to know a bit about her personality style in general. I mean, is she somebody who has depended on her husband for her identity? Um, even though she's had a wonderful marriage, it could well be that without him around it's been very difficult. Um, what was the marriage like over time? I know she said it's great, but particularly before he died, one of the reasons for complicated grief is if, say, they're in the middle of an argument and she kind of wished he was dead at that point and then this happened. So I'd like to know a little bit more about what was going on just before he died as well as after. Um, and then there's the issue of her health. Um, whether she's had any previous health problems, she's said to have rheumatoid arthritis and I would check with the GP whether that's a definite diagnosis, but there is definitely a link between autoimmune disease and depression. It can be the straight um, effects of having an autoimmune disease and having um, an inflammatory process going on, but also in people of Dorothy's age you can get something called cerebral vasculitis which can cause ongoing depression in its own right. And if she's been on steroids because they also can cause precipitated depressive episode. 
I'd want to know about the family history of depression and bipolar disorder and I'd want to know a bit more about what she's actually been doing but I'd be taking great note of the fact that the GP and the daughter know, who know Dorothy well are both concerned. Next. Next slide. So I would be interested in which trajectory is she on. One would be that she initially did well after her death and by doing well she was appropriately grieving her husband but seemed to be getting on top of it and then later developed depressive symptoms or whether she's been depressed all along since he died and that might have more to do with sort of adjustment rather than a discreet episode or whether she says she's been depressed all of her life and um, now things have just got worse which would indicate to me the possibility of more of a personality style. Next one. Next. Uh, and one of the things that I use is what I call a timeline where I just go through and look at the important events on her life. I'd marry up her medical history and um, some other issues which I thought were important. I find you can just do that by dropping a line down the middle of a page and doing it with two columns but I find that a nice way of trying to work out which what led to what. I've ad-libbed with this one and um, said that she remembered she'd had postnatal depression and that now a friend of hers has died. I've just put those in as possible possible thing but that's just to, to give an idea of um, a timeline. Can I go on to the next one? Also on the Black Dog Institute website um, there is this form which uh, can be used to, to try and put all the factors together onto one which people can find very helpful about what might have led to what and that's got um, also room for positive factors and what's the personal meaning of this to the person. So that can be a very useful tool and you can download that from the Black Dog website. Next. But from a psychiatry point of view, the, the important things which would tell me whether this is a clinical depression would be, as opposed to grief, would be that whether there's a change in her self-esteem and she's become much more self-critical and grieving along with having a depressed mood. Features like insomnia, fatigue, anxiety are more non-specific and don't tell me very much. But um, I'd of course note them. But the other really important items uh, looking for a more what I'm calling a melancholic depression would be items like a uh, lot of rumination, hopelessness, diurnal vari mood variation, feeling worse in the morning, better as the day goes on and change in her cognitive pattern whether she's actually appears to be not functioning cognitively as well. I'd also be very interested in her history, not only of panic and previous depression, but of vascular disease, hypertension, diabetes and cancer. And I'd be extremely uh, noteful if both the GP and the daughter said she was much more agitated because that can actually um, make one think of psychosis as well. Next one. Now this is um, something that older people get, it's called a structural melancholia. It's often associated with vascular disease and with Dorothy this would be something I'd be trying to rule out because if she's got this there's no point in sending her off for grief counselling because she's in another place and it, she becomes a suicide risk. But this is in older people where they've got some vascular disease, they've got changes on their uh, these white matter hyperintensities um, and these lead to a depression particularly in the um, if they also have an, an illness like rheumatoid arthritis or steroids any of those things so I'd be very interested to know whether she's um, well, I'd be thinking about whether she's got this structural melancholy because that really needs to be ruled out before uh, you could do anything else and people need to have um, antidepressants if they have got that. Um, that is not the, co I wouldn't necessarily expect you would have that but it needs to be ruled out. Next one. Next slide. Hello. Um, Conrad's mentioned a little bit about suicide risk. I'd be wanting to know if she's been using alcohol, whether she smokes. People who smoke over, uh, 60, over 25 cigarettes a day have four times the rate of suicidal ideation. Whether she's using analgesics or sedatives because obviously these can make you depressed in their own right and can also that they have access. The previous history of depression we've mentioned of suicidality. Um, how, what's the relationship between the grief possible depression and the ideas, how, which led to which, what has she got to live for, the plans have been mentioned, who can she talk to and how concerned is Dorothy herself. 
Next one. So I don't know if you can read this very easily. What I'm saying is I think there are three possible trajectories for Dorothy, which is not clear from the, um, from the story. One is that she was originally okay, managing her grief it is now has had a discreet episode which may be related to some of those factors that I mentioned um, and that needs to be then treated and that may be with cognitive behaviour therapy, maybe with antidepressant, depends on the character of the depression before she goes off to have the grief counselling because if she's got that going on she won't be able to attend to the grief counselling and she will overvalue her place in, and how guilty she is etc. The next one is that there's been this slow, steady burn of grief throughout and she's lost her role, she's lost her identity and that's where I think grief counselling would come in first and uh, it becomes the paramount thing and you'd just be keeping a watching brief to make sure she didn't become depressed. The third one where she says I've been depressed for as long as I can remember would point more to me that she's got a personality style, personality disorder and the grief is just one more thing on top of um, other issues in her life and grief counselling is still appropriate but you would need to factor in that maybe some other issues would arise that weren't obvious at the start that may be part of what's been leading to that. I'm going to leave it there and thank you and sorry I can't see you. Thank you very much Kay. We'll move on now to Greg Roberts um, his responses. Thanks Vicky. Um, so from, from my perspective if we were thinking about whether Dorothy might be able to be referred from a GP under a mental health care plan. Um, I'd be asking the question based on what we know is does Dorothy have a, a chronic adjustment disorder as far as a category that could be used for a mental health care plan. So I'm not necessarily saying that she does but that, that question would, would come up. So basically what we're seeing is that Dorothy's having um, difficulty in adjusting to the loss of Arthur, who's been um, her partner and husband for 30 years. So I think it's quite significant that someone has um, been together for 30 years, and even though it's seven years, um, it's somewhat understandable that, that Dorothy might be having some difficulty adjusting to that, given they seem so um, entwined in their lives. Um, there is also the factor that I'd be wanting to investigate the fact that she has survived for seven years um, seemingly without much intervention and so there's something in that that may suggest that there's a certain level of resilience there in Dorothy. She somehow survived for those seven years. Um, and if we were looking at trying to assist Dorothy, we'd look at trying to help her perhaps move through counselling from having this concrete living attachment to Arthur and looking at ways that she might develop some symbolic attachments to Arthur um, as well as adding in options for things that might help elevate her mood, um, strategies for self-soothing and, and things like that. And basically if we're working on the idea of continuing bonds, this idea of helping Dorothy manage a changed relationship to Arthur and I see that as a, as a key thing. Um, if we're looking at whether this is depression or complicated grief, I just briefly wanted to speak to that and a really simple way for me of thinking about that is that um, depression tends to be a more um, generalised lowered mood um, that impairs the person's daily functioning. Complicated grief or what we seem to refer to these days, it'll probably change again, but currently prolonged grief disorder is this idea of um, a person who has intrusive, unabated thoughts of the person who's died that impairs the person's daily functioning and affects their mood. But we currently don't have a category in the DSM and so possibly the closest we get um, is an adjustment disorder. So adjustment disorder is where there's a heightened stress reaction to a change or perhaps a loss that's brought a change in mood which could be depression, anxiety, a combination of the two and it affects the person's daily life and that potentially could be something that, that fits for Dorothy. So as far as working with her, obviously as Conrad's talked about and Kay's talked about, um, a really thorough assessment. And what I'd emphasise there is that it's useful in my experience to do some formal assessments with some of these tools that I've got up here on the slide, so a K10, PHQ9. I personally find the WEMWIBS quite useful, the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale. 
and it's quite useful. We do have the inventory of complicated grief as well um, that can be used. But I think for me also not forgetting the informal, which is hearing Dorothy's story, actually hearing a little bit about what has been her experience of the last seven years, um, allowing her to talk about what Arthur meant to her, what needs he met for her, was he the main person who understood her as a person. Um, and I think this focus on combining not just treating Dorothy but also providing some understanding to Dorothy around her sense of meaning um, and adjustment to that and reframing things. And for me there's certainly some evidence that there's trauma perhaps in here as well because of the way in which Arthur died and Dorothy getting a bit focused on I should have called an ambulance and that can be quite distressing and quite traumatic to have that going over and over in your mind. If we were to work together as a team in a multidisciplinary way, um, really important to have good consistent communication pathways amongst the team and needing to bring Dorothy on board with that. Um, making sure that Dorothy has a sense of agency in being clear about what each person is actually doing and allowing her to perhaps talk a little bit about what she feels that she, she needs and what's needed for her. Um, as I mentioned, a combination of a willingness to offer understanding, some space for Dorothy to talk about what this means, as well as where needed, some treatment options for symptoms that are actually impairing her function. Um, I'd be looking to help Dorothy perhaps establish meaningful connections or activities in her life as it is now. Um, and I wouldn't be expecting, her daughter seems to suggest they want her to return to activities like caravanning and fishing and I think that would be rather confronting for Dorothy. So life can't return to how it was in the past. Um, life will forever be changed for Dorothy and there needs to be some acceptance of that and working with her around that. So she may do similar activities but doing exactly the same could actually re-trigger some of the grief for Dorothy. So we need to be really cautious about that. And then just to, to sort of conclude, I think some models that can, or theories as well, that can be really useful in um, Dorothy's situation is uh, things like the dual process model, um, the two track model, and both of those ask us to pay attention to how is Dorothy going with her loss experience and her adjustment to this changed relationship to Arthur? Where is she at with that aspect? while also looking at her biopsychosocial functioning, so her day-to-day -day life, how is she going with that? And in the case study, we don't actually know what her day-to-day -day life is like. We hear about her distress, but we don't hear about her day-to-day -day living. Um, continuing bonds, which I've mentioned, and some more emergent theoretical bases around expert companioning or exquisite witnessing, which is more about establishing this therapeutic relationship with Dorothy while she um, adjusts herself and maybe reattaches to things that are important to her. So I'll hand back to you, Vicky, that's sort of my perspective. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, uh, Greg, that was very interesting. Moving along to um, Prof Associate Professor Moira O'Connor. Moira. Yeah. Hi. Um, we know then that primary care and general practitioners in particular have a very clear role to play in mental health and bereavement support and this is particularly the case as the population ages. And the role of the GP is twofold, so it's supporting that the GPs support their patients and also offer appropriate referral when that's necessary. However, the research indicates clearly that this relies on a knowledge of mental health issues and bereavement active listening and responding in a very short period of time and a willingness to refer importantly. And again research suggests that this may be very problematic. A UK study of GPs found that there was very little awareness of current models of grief. The GPs were stuck in the stage based theory and Kubler-Ross and, and, and old theories that are not relevant to contemporary understandings. An education on dying, death and bereavement is often very limited in medical schools. And this is not just GPs, this is across health professionals generally, certainly in primary care. In our study of GPs, we found, moving on to the, 
slide. Um, sorry. Um, and after your GPs, can somebody move the slide on for me, please? Um, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. Thank you. In our study of GPs, we found a lack of clarity and a complete lack of consistency. There was patchy knowledge and really a little bit of everything thrown in. In fact, even within individual GPs, they moved from one state of certainty to another state of certainty in a matter of minutes. There was also a very heavy reliance on personal experience, which you know, is, is, is fine for the patient and, and um, the relationship in many ways. It could lead to problems for patients that don't fit into a mold and also lead to burnout for GPs, and we found that in patient care research. Some GPs referred, but many really were very reluctant and unwilling. There were some barriers, some obvious barriers, and that included the mental health pr practitioner not getting back to the, mental, to the health um, professional, to the GP, to continue care and support the patient. So there was a little bit of irritation around that, confusion over item numbers and paperwork, especially paperwork, and a lack of knowledge of referral pathways and who's out there and what's out there. The next slide, please. Um, so health professionals emphasize their own worst type of loss. So for some, it would be the death of a child. For others, a partner of long standing. And one GP mentioned stillbirth as being the most outstanding um, and, and worst case scenario. But we know from systematic research and from research evidence that complicated or prolonged grief reactions are less likely to be related to those factors, such as the situation or type of loss, and are more likely to be to do with a relationship with a person or attachment style, which has been mentioned. The public health model of grief emphasizes that most people don't need any extra support. They're going to get by and accommodate their loss, adjust to their loss, and live with their loss with friends, family, um, or, or the social world that they live in, the community they're involved in. Some people need community support, and that could be necessary to refer people on to those supports. And a significant minority that we've been talking about need access to a mental health professional. And this minority has been placed internationally around about 10% to 12%. Mm -hmm. Slide, please. Prolonged grief disorder that we've talked about is one form of complicated grief. It causes significant social and work problems and challenges everyday functioning. And we've all heard of cases of people having great difficulty just getting out of bed, great difficulty going to the shops, getting out of the house and that everyday functioning is, is impacted on greatly. It's also associated with suicidality, poor health-related quality of life, and also substance abuse and alcohol abuse. Importantly for all of us, there's less likelihood of this group actually seeking assistance. They're very reluctant to seek assistance um, from mental health services. Again, we emphasize the GP's role as a broker in this instance. It also involves separation distress, an unrelenting yearning for the deceased, and a sense of meaninglessness, and difficulties accepting the loss. And all of these remain elevated for longer than six months. We can see from the case study that Dorothy is talking about some of these issues, and so she does need to be depressed or have complications of grief, um, and we've been through how to do that. So what is needed? What's the way forward? And certainly we need research, but we also need grief education to alert health professionals generally, these in particular, but also the community out there to the range of responses. And that there's not one set way of grieving, but we might have some things that, that raise red flags and we need to be um, aware of. We also need to target our care appropriately to those most in need. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is research that shows that if you're offering services, mental health services and support to people who don't need them, it can be more harmful than beneficial. And we need to base that on the intensity, the complexity, and the persistence of these symptoms of grief or mental health. We also need interventions, including one-on-one -on -one supports, inevitably, but also other forms of interventions. And we've been trialing a metacognitive therapy for cr prolonged grief disorder, and that shows promise, looking at how people think 
about um, grief and, and, and what um, enables and keeps them going into this morass of being locked into this grief disorder. And also we've got a, a therapeutic um, intervention for middle group from that public health model, and that's writing therapy um, for elevated um, distress. And that focuses on some of the things that Greg mentioned, such as making meaning, telling your story, and also a lot of research has shown that writing is in fact useful for people who've been through traumatic experiences. So we really have a way to go, but there are some really strong possibilities out there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Moira. We move on to um, the next this references of Moira's to a, a, what we call a Q&A session. Um, there are hundreds and hundreds of questions came through on various topics related to this. Um, but first of all, our panellists also had questions for one another that um, I'll pose to start things off. Um, so Greg is asking for Kay and or Conrad to, um, the question is how might we differentiate between a depressed mood associated with grief and a depressed mood associated with clinical depression? Would you like to start that off, Kay, and would you like me to repeat the question? No, that's all right. I, I think um, that a depressed mood just associated with grief would be more along the lines of what Greg's already talked about, where they're ruminating about the person and about the incidents, mm -hmm. but it's not, it doesn't broaden beyond that. If people have um, a more a, a clinical depression, I would expect them to have uh, more changes in their self-esteem and their, and do much more ruminating on a, a broader level about um, guilt and bringing up other things from the past. And but it's that rumination that I think is very important. But then some of those other factors that I mentioned would be more to do with the clinical depression, the anhedonia, uh, lack of reactivity, all those sort of things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's about okay, it. thank you. Conrad, was there anything you'd like to add to that, to that question? There's not necessarily a lot, a lot more to add to it. I, I think it, it certainly goes back to the, the timelines that uh, that Kay had mentioned about mm -hmm. what was the trajectory, what was what was going on before the before the incident that uh, that brought the grief response on. So we we see in Dorothy's case that she seemed quite happy with with things beforehand, although she might have been uh, quite diminutive and, and and kept to herself and her small family unit. That was that was satisfying to her and, and gave gave her meaning in, in her life. But we all know uh, patients and individuals who we would be worried about how they would cope with a real stressful event. That we know that they've already got um, poor functioning skills, poor supports around them, may have had prior depressive episodes in the past. So it's, it is very difficult to be able to define which way somebody is going to go and whether it was actually the grief that put them over. Or the right. But the other part too is that it's very, very seldom that, particularly in, in general practice, that these will just present to you one day saying, this is what I'm presenting with, you know, this is the whole story. Because that trajectory, knowing how somebody has evolved over a period of time, uh, when do you actually take the snapshot is never an easy question to answer. Thanks, Vicky. Just so if I can go back and say that d depression is also difficult because it can come on quite slowly and people can say, well, of course, she's depressed because she's grieving um, and it can become quite bad before people actually realise that it's qualitatively different. I'm not hearing anything. No, back to you, Vicky. Okay, thank you. Um, Greg was also wondering or commenting that and he made this point in his presentation that Doris, Dorothy has survived and lived independently for seven years since Arthur's death. Um, what does this tell us about her? Would you like to start that off, Conrad? Yes, yeah, certainly. I think that it definitely demonstrates 
that there's some degree of resilience uh, in, inherent in, in Dorothy. We've, uh, we've been, been looking at, at her story and, and hearing her story so far, and although we're, we're seeing this, uh, this acute deterioration in her condition now, which really it's been her daughter that has, has brought to, to the light of day, uh, you know, that Dor- Dorothy must have some degree of resilience, that she hasn't shut herself off from her activities of daily living. You know, we'd assume that she's still cooking, cleaning, looking after herself, going along to the shops, uh, you know, doing all those, those activities so that her, her family and, and her have always expected of her. So for some reason or another, it didn't really become obvious at an earlier stage that, uh, that she was in, in such, a, such a poor way. And uh, so that, that's really my, my, my perspective on this, is that what, what is it? Because we, at some stage, we need to demonstrate or, or, or find in Dorothy where was that strength that kept you going through all of this. She's already been through that terribly traumatic time of having to sort out the will and clean out the rooms and do all of those horrible things which are often associated in that, that acute bereavement phase. Um, she found the strength back then to get through it. We need to help Dorothy find where is that strength, where is that resilience that might bring us back to that, that stage again. So I'd love to hear what our, our social work uh, perspective on that might be, Greg. Thanks, Conrad. That, no, that's very good what you had to say. I, I, um, I raise this question because, you know, very often you see that we can think that someone is, um, you know, struggling and there's a problem there, but I think we also have to look to what's been working. And so just the pure fact that Dorothy's managed to um, get to seven years post-loss um, surely tells us that over those seven years she has developed perhaps some coping strategies. And the part that that emphasises for me is that in spite of the seven years that Dorothy is still um, missing Arthur terribly and facing a future without Arthur and maybe after seven years um, is coming to terms with the fact of, you know, this feels like it's just going on and on and that's sort of depleting her. Um, And I think as Kay also mentioned, we do have to be cautious that um, if someone is experiencing the the depths of grief for an extended period of time, it may um, be something that can lead to clinical depression over time. But I think we should definitely be looking at not just the immediate um, presentation, but looking at the fact that she has survived for seven years and probably has some strategies in there, as you say, Conrad, that we might be able to re-establish, perhaps. Can I just come in and say that I think we do need to separate out those three trajectories that I mentioned? Because, Mm -hmm. I mean, one is that she survived, but she's actually been drinking or taking analgesics to survive and deal with the pain, and it hasn't been a very good adjustment, and now it's just gone on and got worse. The other is that she has been doing really well, but we don't actually know and I think we're assuming, <laughs> we're liking to think she's done well, but it's, it's possible that she hasn't. And I think very gently we've got to find out more about what, is, what has been happening. And I think that also goes back to what identity she's got away from Arthur. Um, so while I'd love to believe that she's been doing really well, I don't think it's absolutely a given that because she's still there seven years later um, that she's been doing well. Yeah, no, and it's not necessarily that she's been doing well, but more that she has survived for that yes, period yes. of time. And I think, you know, your three trajectories are, are really quite useful for people to, to have a look at. And it's really, as I mentioned as well, you know, because we just have this case study that we need to hear more of Dorothy's story of what yep. those past seven years have actually been like and, yes. and what she has done to try and survive and how functional some of that's been or potentially not helpful. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, a further question from a panel member is, and it's quite a kind of big one, what can we do to make it easier for GPs and health professionals to respond sensitively and appropriately to grief? and refer appropriately if necessary. Who'd like to start that one? Hmm. 
I think Kay would, uh, Kay's, uh, Kay's study w w was fantastic looking at uh, what were the deficiencies that GPs felt that they, that they had and, and Kay I'd, I'd really like to, to hear more about what solutions might have come out of that study. Kay or Moira? Oh sorry, Moira. Moira, sorry. Moira. Moira. Yes, yes, um, well that's why I posed the question, um, yeah, what, what do we do about this? I mean my, my idea is that we have education but it's very difficult to get GPs, very busy GPs running their own businesses to come along to professional development and, and they tend, as you will know, to go along to things that are of particular interest to them. Um, so, and we can't make it compulsory. Liz Love in 2006 wrote um, a paper um, just outlining some um, hints and, and tips for GPs um, to you know help them to refer and to you know help them pick up on on complications of grief. Um, so something like that would be very helpful as well. I feel, but um, yeah, I think the more we can get GPs to go along, and as I say, with the aging population, we're going to a lot of GPs are going to be faced with this a daily basis, if if not a you know a weekly basis, if not a daily basis. So yeah, I'd, I'd welcome any suggestions, and we certainly will do more work in this area. Yeah, and if, and if I could just pop in there, Moira, to follow yeah. up from that. Um, look, from from my experience, I've been involved in doing a bit of training with GPs in a few areas, and I think, as you said, whenever I've done that, um, even when well organised, um, it's really hard time-wise for GPs to get to um, education sessions. And most of them say to me that they're rather. Um, by just going over a basic session about grief education, they say, you know, it's amazing all through my training, I possibly only did um, a few hours on grief and loss and I noticed that that came up in your, your research, Moria, as well. So I think one of the other things we can do is actually in real time. So for social workers, psychologists who have experience in grief and bereavement to develop good relationships with GPs, and to be able to, while working with clients, to provide information directly to the GP about the individual situation of the person. And so for GPs to have that willingness to have conversations with grief and bereavement counsellors as part of an education process alongside trying to incorporate more grief and loss education into areas like medicine, nursing, those areas that at present still don't get a lot of training specifically on, on grief and bereavement. Yes, I agree. And, and we've done some work also with GPs in the area of, of patient care and, and we see GPs and community pharmacists and uh, practice nurses and, and primary care health professionals in general as being part of the palliative care team. And that's not just during the patient's illness, but after the patient's death, looking after and supporting the um, former caregivers. Um, so yeah, I, I agree there needs to be more and relationship building. So um, I agree totally with that. And, and I think, Conrad, in your um, initial um, presentation, you were talking about that teamwork and, and um, how essential it is. Yeah, absolutely, Moira. And, and what, but that also is a two-way uh, two relationship in that it is very important that us as GPs recognise where our boundaries are and where our strengths and weaknesses lie. And for many of us, we, we would be completely folly to think that we're going to have all of these skills and, and techniques. You know, things like EMDR, there's no way I'm going to try taking on, on something like that. But ACT, sure, that, that's probably got a, a great role. But it would be really useful for for those of, of you who are actually uh, having referring GPs for, for things like grief, it, the, many of you will set your clients some homework to do between between sessions. And it's great if you can feed that back to the GP as well. You know, this is the stuff which we've been working on over this past month. Could you please maybe reinforce this? at your consultations between our, between our sessions. That's a great way for the GPs to learn and to pick up skills as well. And it also is going to help a lot in making sure that you and the GP are on the same wavelength when you're, when you're discussing the, the care of the, the patient there too. So now I wouldn't, I wouldn't for, the, for the start, say that I'm, a, I'm an expert on, on grief counselling. I hope that I can recognise when something's going wrong, but more importantly, who I've got to reach out for to, to help there with it. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you, Conrad. Look, as I said, there are lots and lots of questions and we're kind of running out of time a bit, but um, 
several questions asked about cultural issues, cultural and spiritual issues, and given um, recent events for some time in Australia and elsewhere, would any of the panel like to comment on how we kind of address those with the, um, our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community, with people from the Middle East, people from Asian countries? Sort of any, any particular thoughts about that? Just, um, you know, would you like to start, um, Kay? <laughs> You don't have to give us a thesis about it, but you know what to think about it. when we address it, people from those kind of backgrounds who might come in. What do we? What's important to keep in mind? I think to be aware that they may have different points of view. There is a um, a cultural centre in Sydney which you can refer to and get multicultural centre and get some ideas from them. I'd be trying to talk to someone from that culture if it's possible to find out what's different. Um, I don't know that I have any particular ideas about that. Um, I just might mention that it's slightly different angle, but in medicine today, this month, I've got something about using attachment for GPs. And we do mention in there that while there are cultural aspects to it, um, attachment theory in general does seem to transcend culture and I think it's a good, a good way to go. But I think you've got to ask people from the different cultures as to what's, what's similar and what's different. I was recently on a working party with a working group. It's very difficult to hear with, is it crickets in the background? No, it seems to be some feedback from somewhere. Oh, Sorry. right, okay. Is it okay now? Yep. I was um, with a group that were looking at um, education for patient care professionals and, and those using a palliative approach in terms of, of cultural issues and one thing that I took from that um, was that people were saying ask, ask the person, ask the yeah. person what's appropriate for them rather than making assumptions that it will be different or it has to be different or that all people from a particular cultural group will have a, a similar um, but rather just, you know, what what can I do for you? What will help you? What will support you? How should this go for you? So I, I found that very helpful um, yeah. and um, very simple. Yeah, I think that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so, Greg or Conrad, any further comments about that one? Um, Cultural and spiritual kind of uh, approaches or... I would, I would just yeah. add to what Moira had to say um, that really that perspective of working with the person because I think it's really important that we don't start generalising culture. So you can have two people from seemingly the same culture but the nuances of how they enact aspects of their culture can be different. So as Moira said, I think it is a really simple, straightforward and useful strategy to ask the person, you know, to be willing to not assume anything and allow them to teach you about their culture while you offer perhaps whatever expertise you have in your area. So it becomes a, a shared relationship where you work together. Yeah, I, I agree completely, Greg. And the the other uh, the other point which I noticed that many of our pan and many of our attendees have also raised is that we need to also put this not only into the the cultural mix, but also the lifespan uh, section of this as well. In that since the since the the death of Arthur, of course, her, her children have probably grown up and, and left home. They've now started their own homes. She's probably now gone through menopause. She's now on uh, you know quite strong medications, perhaps for her rheumatoid. Arthritis. So, it, it, we, it, even though she's obviously probably from an Anglo-Saxon or Caucasian background, and you know, living a, probably what is quite a suburban lifestyle, uh, the external. Uh, stresses the external factors that are, that are playing on uh, on Dorothy might be completely separate to those issues affecting another 55 year old lady living two streets down from her you know it, it's very difficult for us to assume that you know one person from one group you know all the people from from uh, from one, one group thank you I'm, I'm that having to technical stuff I think happening. Um, another 
Yeah, look, I won't try and get another question in, but thank you all so much for your questions. They're very broad-ranging and um, covering all age groups, all sorts of circumstances and situations. Um, we've just got a few minutes left, so I'd just like to ask each panel member if they could just, um, I guess, sum up and reflect on what they, um, what the issue of collaboration around this particular issue. So I'll start with you, um, Greg. Okay, thanks, Vicky. Look, I, I just think one of the key things as far as collaboration is just that, collaboration of communicating well with each other um, when working with Dorothy and not, not leaving Dorothy out of that picture. It's actually collaborating with Dorothy as well. Um, and I guess the, the other area that we would want to be connected about is the area of um, suicidality that might be there for Dorothy. So from my perspective, we just need to be cautious that, again, we don't jump in and think that Dorothy straight away is suicidal simply because she, she says something like, I don't want to be here. Because sometimes when people are grieving, they have this feeling of being completely overwhelmed and it's purely an expression of, you know, I, I just want this to stop, but there isn't any active suicidality. But then equally on the flip side, we have to take that statement seriously and actually inquire with Dorothy. And in my experience, in my work around people who are suicidal, really important that everybody involved with the person is aware that potentially that might be an issue and has everybody sort of checked with Dorothy about that so that we get consistency. Um, some people in the interdisciplinary team, Dorothy might speak to more openly than others and so we need to keep checking that and making sure that we're not inadvertently pushing Dorothy in a particular direction when she's just simply trying to express something but equally that we make sure that um, she's not actively suicidal so everyone on the team needs to be clear about that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Moving on to say, Conrad, do you have any reflections, just a minute or so of reflections on the collaborative aspects of this um, challenging area of work, I guess? Absolutely, Vicky. And, and you know, there's a few real strong lessons that, that I and, and many of my other GP colleagues will take out, out of this, is that familiarity, I shouldn't say breeds contempt, but it is, it is very, very easy to, to cruise along for years and years and, and not really see the changes that's happening with the, the patients who we, we know so well. So it really takes quite a bit of self-discipline uh, to make yourself actually look for some fresh eyes, maybe even do have your patients see one of your colleagues every once in a while, uh, just to see, is there something that, that I'm missing, you know? Could this actually be a thyroid issue? Might this have been menopausal things that, that are going on? So number one is to, to always make sure that you're not just sitting in a, in a rut that can go on for years and years. But number two certainly is that we don't want to medicalise normal grief response. We don't want to you know, sedate or, or medicalise that, that, that response. But we have to recognise when something's not moving along, it might be time to get somebody with some, a broader skill set uh, involved at, at that stage. Thanks, Suki. Thanks, everybody, for participation. Thank you very much, Conrad. Um, Kay, do you have any final reflections? Um, well, I'd be called in when um, Conrad is worried and before uh, Greg is called in. It was where I see my place. I see my place in this to create a holistic narrative of what's going on, which looks at both um, social, physical and mental factors and to screen out important reversible issues which could be perpetuating or get in the way of her grieving and creating some sort of an overview. And I agree with Conrad that at times you seen someone for a long time and they may not want to tell you something um, if they've known you well and it may be sometimes that I could ask questions like about her drinking which she hasn't wanted to fess up to which may be an issue but I also completely agree with not over medicalizing the case and if you've noticed I haven't been pushing antidepressants or whatever I think they have their, their place particularly if she's got a melancholic depression or very significant clinical episode but in general I think she needs to examine her roles in life 
do her grief counselling and find a way of moving on. And I completely agree with my colleagues. Okay, thank you very much. So we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, thank you to our panellists and thank you all very much for logging on and participating with such enthusiasm. Key messages I guess are that there's a lot to learn about complicated grief as it's sometimes called. Um, I guess one of the issues I think of is the importance of supervision and working together and peer support in this area. Um, so best wishes to all of you as you um, explore this further. Now I've been asked to encourage you to fill out an exit survey and keep an eye out for future webinars. There are a couple coming up in April and May, one on addressing social and emotional being of older LGBTI people and in May one on supporting students experience anxiety while completing end of high school studies. So that's, um, they're both very important webinars. There we are. Um, yes, and also think about setting up your own um, MHPN network in your geographical area where you live. I don't know if they can be conducted by um, Skype and so on, but it's worth exploring. And finally, before I close, I'd like to acknowledge the consumers and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. And thank you again to everyone for your participation this evening and for being patient with our technical issues. Thanks again. Good night.